Right. Thank you. So uh, I would like to introduce uh, to you the uh, list of authors which worked for many years on this uh, topic which I present here, namely um, matter in astrophysics and in heavy ion collisions. And we also uh, use some gravitational wave information to study the uh, material equation of state of nuclear matter at high densities and high temperatures. Uh, the first author is a former student um, of uh, Bogolyubov Institute, who actually did uh, about a year and a half ago in Frankfurt his PhD, Anton Motornenko. He is uh, since a year and a half or so um, postdoctoral fellow of the Stern Gerlach uh, Prize winner of the Polytechnical um, Society in Frankfurt. And Pia Jacobus, she is now in uh, Australia. Unfortunately, my dear colleague Stefan Schramm uh, uh, passed away a few years ago. Jan Steinheimer is the uh, group leader in this at FIAS. And you see also another list of names, uh, Elias Most, who is now a junior professor or assistant professor in Princeton, uh, uh, almost finished Dr. Kutan. Uh, Lukas Wai, who has already finished, Matthias Hanauske, who has been uh, with us working for 20 years, my successor at the Institute for Theoretical Physics in Frankfurt, Luciano Rezzola, who has been very active um, in uh, this field of binary neutron star collisions and black hole camera pictures. They are all from the Institute for Theoretical Physics. And then there is uh, my former graduate student and uh, later postdoc, Volodya Vovchenko, who was at LBL and uh, was recently uh, moving to Seattle uh, for the Institute of Nuclear Theory. His uh, uh, future is um, uh, uh, probably next, next year. He will move over to uh, University of Houston in Texas on a professorship. So this is supported by a lot of different um, groups. And uh, I just would like to mention the Samson AG and the Polytechnical Society, Goethe University and GSI, where I have been a, a, a scientific director for many years and the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And then this is the graduate schools and uh, the future project FAIR. I will talk briefly about FAIR. A little bit later. So I'm not sure whether you see this because I'd like to move this away from this so you can read my headline. Let me put it down here. Do you see this little bar? Yes, yes. Uh, we, we can see uh, the photo, a slide. I, I would like to remove the bar, but I don't know how to do this. <laughs> okay. we, we don't see we don't see this bar. We don't oh, you don't see the bar, then it's okay. So um, this is uh, what is going on in the universe. Uh, as you remember, Einstein, who was uh, German, born in Ulm, later uh, moved to Switzerland and then back to Germany and then saved himself from the Nazis by escaping to the United States. He published a theory, a theory of general relativity in 1915. And it says, T mu nu equals R mu nu. But this is not really his final word. He also said, T mu nu equals R mu nu plus a term R squared. This is, has not been um, solved by him, but we are working here with Professor Struckmeier on this uh, extended general theory of relativity. But the main idea is gravity governs the motion of masses and light by curving space time. Karl Schwarzschild, who was a Frankfurter, he was a young student in the Physikalische Verein in Frankfurt, then moved to Strasbourg and did his PhD. And uh, he was at that time a very famous uh, astronomer building nonlinear um, lens systems for telescopes. He was born in Frankfurt, but uh, then lived in uh, Göttingen and in Berlin. 
And he solved these, according to Einstein at that time, completely unsolvable, elegant equations within a few months um, and uh, was actually delivering two final papers. One is the point source solution of general relativity, which today we call static black holes without spin. And um, in the last article he made, he predicted also a neutron star type solution of general relativity. He died just after publishing these articles. And Einstein uh, actually um, tried to predict gravitational waves in 1915, but he didn't succeed. He made a few mistakes and I will show you, um, I will show you um, uh, later. Um, what is important is we see a new universe and uh, the question is what are the most compact objects which we can have? And the most compact objects can be either neutron stars, and we all know neutron stars are basically a compact filling of space, like a huge nucleus, mostly neutrons and protons and electrons to keep the charge neutral for the neutron stars. And they have a typical radius of 15 kilometers and a typical mass between one and two solar masses. But it could be when you add more masses to the neutron stars that they don't blow up, but they shrink because the nonlinearity in the general relativity theory leads to an overwhelming gravitational force, which then could create in the center of the neutron star, for instance, hyperonic matter, or here you see even quark matter. And there could be if there's even more mass added that you form quark stars, which are mostly filled in the interior by deconfined protons and neutrons, which basically means it's a kind of a cold quark matter star. And if you add even more mass to the system, then the density in the center would increase from normal nuclear matter density to two times, five times, and then suddenly collapses and forms a black hole where you have um, no way of going inside of the Schwarzschild radius. So uh, this very interesting finding um, has to be confronted now with the theory of quantum chromodynamics. Theory of quantum chromodynamics has been solved in the last couple of decades by doing so-called lattice quantum chromodynamics, numerical simulations. But unfortunately, this is only possible even till today for zero baryochemical potential for zero net baryon number, which is Op extremely opposite from a neutron star or a quark star solution. So what is known today, all what is known today about quantum chromodynamics of baryon dense systems has to be put into a model. Uh, and here I present to you the model which uh, Anton Motornenko actually studied, uh, which was originally devised by Stefan Schramm and Jan Steinheimer, uh, and we published this about a decade ago or so. But uh, a lot of details have to enter in physical details which describe the phenomenology of QCD. Ch uh, chirality, SU3 flavor, the fact that there are parity doublets, uh, the nucleon is accompanied by an N star, and so on. <coughs> then quark degrees of freedom. And this is what is contained in this uh, chiral mean field model equation of state, which is representing almost all of what we know about QCD for cold baryon dense matter, which is not accessible uh, because of parity, uh, because of um, 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 a problem in the uh, equation uh, of QCD. So here I show you a, a quick glimpse uh, Anton's picture, which shows as a function of the temperature in the upper left-hand side, the pressure, the orange line here, and the energy density, and three times the entropy density divided by four with respect to T to the four, T to the four, T to the three. And you see the pressure is about 
one half, you think, oops, I'm sorry. Russia is about one third of the, um, of the energy density. This would be an ideal gas, but this is apparently not the case, at least not uh, um, visible in here. Here you see the pressure and uh, the energy density, uh, three times the pressure and the energy density come close to each other. But here there is a big difference from four to eight factor of two or so, not one third. And the Stefan Boltzmann uh, limit is achieved in lattice QCD calculations at very high temperatures, but not at temperatures um, below 150 or 200 uh, million electron volts. You see here as a function of the biochemical potential, there is a chiral transition here, but that's not a dramatic uh, transition you will see later. And we have lots and lots of experimental findings which are um, um, resolving a lot of the QCD knowledge. Here, for instance, you have the uh, influence of the baryon eigenvolumes um, on the equation of state is again is the energy density here three times the pressure and you see there is a big difference this is in our paper uh, of Volotya and Mark Wernstein um, a few years ago six years ago however you also see here that there is a critical point which shows um, there is a first order phase transition and you also see this first order phase transition goes all the way down to nuclear mass. So there is a gas liquid phase transition in nuclear matter. And um, this is at very moderate temperatures, less than 20 MeV and at normal baryon density. This is uh, what we would call a, a warm vapor of nucleons and light nuclei with a big chunk <laughs> of liquid, which uh, you would call the nucleus. But as I will show you later, there is, uh, let me just jump over the uh, technicality here. There is um, uh, at high temperature, a much more dramatic transition. Uh, that is here, the one I just was talking about, liquid vapor is down here somewhere, 20 MeV but there's a much more dramatic transition and that is the parity doubling. Here you have uh, in this model uh, results which are very, very close to the lattice QCD results, which I show here. Here you see when you increase the temperature, I'm sorry, when you increase the temperature, the nucleon mass and the N star mass become almost degenerate at roughly 200 MeV. And this is true for the octet, and this is all over the place. You see that the nucleons don't change their mass much, but the nucleon resonances, which are the parity double, um, they actually massively change their masses and come down to almost hit the nucleon mass. So that's a dramatic transition. And um, we'll have to see how this all uh, is visible in experimental data. Here you also see another very important uh, aspect, comparison of the lattice QCD according to Anton Motonenko's and uh, Volodya Vovchenko's calculations depend very strongly on the eigenvolumes <laughs> of uh, the hadrons which you have in the system, the conserved baryon correlations, chi, squared, which you see here, baryon charge, baryon charge, electric charge, electric charge, strangeness charge, strangeness charge. They depend sensitively, as you can see here, on what is the volume parameter which you put into the mesons uh, in the soup here. And you see that you can more um, uh, closely come to this uh, lattice QCD results when you adjust your volume parameter to a rather small value here, the red line here, that is about one eighth of a cubic gram, so a rather moderate uh, volume parameter for the, for the um, mesons. And a similar result you can also see in the baryons. So you also compare here the chiral mean field model to perturbative 
quantum chromodynamic estimates, which were done by Kirk Kela, Romachke, and Buorinen. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I always touched the wrong one. Um, here you see that also this um, pressure versus Stefan Boltzmann pressure as a function of biochemical potential is also found. Uh, of course, this orange curves of uh, Kokela et al. show a very broad range, so it's not really uh, possible to pin it down to a 1% or 10% level. But the CMF, the chiral mean field model, covers very nicely this uh, band and actually has rather moderate uh, uncertainties at, uh, let's say, around um, moderate baryon density and has also almost no uncertainty and coincides with the curve here. But in the middle region at about two GeV chemical potential, big differences. Well, also in neutron, in neutron stars, we have um, a very nice um, discussion going on. And what we have done, we have plotted our CMF uh, results here, which is in good agreement with uh, neutron star phenomenology, and it's in good agreement with perturbative calculations. And in the middle, it has a quite uh, strict um, prediction. Here is Anton's picture. He has worked on this now for three, four years during his PhD thesis and also during his postdoc times. And what you see here is the prediction of this model for neutron star masses and radii in this chiral mean field model. Here you see actually the function of the radius versus the uh, um, mass of the neutron star. You see for moderate masses, very light neutron stars, who nobody knows whether they really exist, they would be rather big. And as I said before, when you come closer to the Schwarzschild radius and get very strong nonlinearities in the Oppenheimer-Volkov equations, you get suddenly this huge rise of the maximum mass in the center of the neutron star, and the radius almost doesn't change. And then suddenly, you see here blue line, Blue line means that you have between a quarter and one third of the nucleons and actually many more in the center of the neutron star. Then the system gets flat here. You can increase the mass, but then suddenly you cannot increase the mass anymore. Here it almost jumps at 13 kilometers by a factor of two to three. And then you cannot increase the mass anymore and suddenly the system becomes instable and collapses. So uh, you cannot reach stable neutron stars according to this very clear prediction. Um, as soon as the neutron star has a mass of a little bit above two solar masses, it gets to a radius of 11 kilometers, but you cannot increase the mass further because then the radius shrinks and the system collapses. This is interesting uh, result, again, from Anton. And it shows you that here, in this region, the composition of the neutron star radically changes very quickly. And this is because there are down quarks, up quarks, and strange quarks suddenly appearing, not in a phase transition, but in a crossover transition. And when you look here, about 10% that's the magic number of the material in, at high density. This is about density six of nuclear matter density. About 10% of the system is neutrons. A little bit less is protons. Here are the doublet partners of the neutron and the proton and 10% uh, for all the different quarks. So it's a mix of quarks, hyperons, neutrons, protons. The electric charge here is required to be always zero. Um, so you always have to have as many negative particles as protons and heavier baryon resonances. Very interesting. And then above density six, the majority of the particles would be quarks. However, you don't know whether you come to a density 10 or 15, because as I showed before, the system, as soon as you get to more than 25 to 30 percent quarks, the system may collapse. 
So that's a very interesting question. And these two gentlemen have uh, discussed this and we published this. Uh, also tidal deformabilities, which have been measured by gravitational wave analysis, give moderately broad bands here of lambda and of the radius. And uh, the CMF model is in rather reasonable agreement uh, with uh, the prediction uh, of the, uh, with the experimental results. So let me come now to the dynamics. Uh, until now, this was all static uh, performances. Here I show you a, a paper by Elias Moss and uh, co-authors, including uh, also now uh, new results, um, which we have uh, found. And it's uh, still under uh, scientific review um, with Anton and uh, others. This is what happens if you have a binary neutron star collision, a merger in the universe of two neutron stars seems to be not as rare as you may normally think. There's a lot of binary neutron star systems. They rotate around each other for ages, millions and billions of years. But finally, the attraction overwhelms the rotational uh, resistance and because they emit gravitational waves, soft gravitational waves for a long time. They lose energy, angular momentum, and they run into each other. And what we have shown is that in collisions of two neutron stars, you can get to the quark matter phase transition, and you get signatures of this from the gravitational waves. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is the paper of Einstein, which was finally presented to the Prussian Academy of Science after the First World War was over in 1918. Translated, it says, I have published one and a half years ago, that means 1916, um, a work here in the Prussian Academy of Science. However, this presentation was not very transparent. And by the way, also had a mistake in the calculation, very elegant formulation of that paper was just rubbish. And then he presented what is now known as the theory of gravitational waves one and a half years later. This is the idea. You see a quadrupole oscillation here, which is measured in gravitational wave detectors, which have very long legs, 90 degrees apart, as shown here. And then you see laser interferometers on these, but you probably know that the laser interferometer um, can measure unbelievably small differences, namely uh, one thousandth of a proton radius on a distance of three kilometers. So that makes a signal to length ratio of 10 to the 21, unbelievable. And that was done with uh, LIGO in the US, two big detectors like this, and Virgo in Italy, and they have measured several uh, collisions of two neutron stars and several collisions of two um, black holes. Let's go and look at what uh, was done in our paper here. The paper represents a uh, res result of relativistic, general relativistic, and special relativistic hydrodynamic equations. This is not the Euler, this is the Euler equations, but not the classical Euler, non-relativistic, but the relativistic Euler equations, coupled to Maxwell equations to get the electromagnetic pieces in. So T is just the fluid T for the baryons and mesons and electrons, plus the electromagnetic team you knew, which is the Maxwellian part. And the pressure is very complicated. It depends on the energy density, on the baryon density, and on the ratio of leptons and so on. This is solved numerically. And I show you here a typical result, which is a slingshot of two neutron stars, which hit each other. And a lot of angular momentum is transferred to the rest, then the gravitational wave is emitted, but it keeps on emitting gravitational waves. Here you see excited matter going out in the z direction. This is just in the xy plane. Here you see it again. And you see also uh, the electron fraction here. 
and you actually recognize this is the projection. This is the projection of this on this side, and there is nothing projected here. But now you see, as soon as they come later, boom, enormous uh, emission of internal energy uh, into the polar regions. This gives rise to the jets we all know about. So as long as this uh, system here is not spherical, but it has a, a quadrupole, it can directly be detected by these quadrupole detectors with high sensitivity. Here I show you now the gravitational wave. Let me let me go back. Uh, here I show you the gravitational wave. I'm sorry. I show you the gravitational wave. This is the oscillation before the two neutron stars meet. This is the point where you, which you call merger. That is where all this chaos breaks out and no clean uh, reference system can be seen. But then you see from this frequency here, which is shown here, time is down here, given in milliseconds. From the merger point, we count zero. Before zero, it's minus one, minus two, minus three milliseconds. This is typical uh, 200 hertz, roughly 200 hertz, which we see. Then here, suddenly the system is very close together. And I show this by dancing. Here you see Disco Fox, the two guys are far away from each other. And here you see the configuration. Here is Merengue, so the two are very close together. And then you see the frequency jumps by almost an order of magnitude from 300 Hertz to three kilohertz, 3000 Hertz. And you see that the system vibrates, rotates very, very fast. It vibrates, it bounces, and it rotates very fast. And you see here, maxima minima, which actually correspond to changes in the uh, macroscopic configuration. The system uh, collapses and expands, collapses and expands because the pressure drives the two neutron stars apart of each other. Now I will let the system run and you can, oh, sorry, and you can see what I say. Now you come to the chaos line. This is where the chaos starts. Now the system becomes much more compact. It rotates much faster. And you see that the two guys come together, go apart, come together, go apart. And now this rotates and rotates. And suddenly here, the system freezes. Why does it freeze? Because the most part of the system collapses behind the Schwarzschild radius, behind the event horizon. And suddenly, um, you can say this is the end stadium of a tango where nothing moves anymore just stand still because of the time dilatation. So you see the system is more calm now, the amplitude reduces. And now when we reach this point on the right-hand side, you see, patch, it's gone. Black hole is formed and you have no signal no more. So now we have analyzed this system and you see this here. We analyze the system in the temperature density plane and it is very interesting. We see two different regions in the temperature density plane. One is not the central part, but it's a little bit away um, uh, in the radius, let's say to five to 10 kilometers or so that is here. So there the temperature is high, very high actually between 40 and 80 million electron volts. And this is a very interesting phase, which is um, rotating rather quickly around the center. However, then there is a second area, which is here, where we have uh, uh, other uh, pieces, 10 MeV temperature, so one tenth or something like this, 10%, 15% of the temperature, but much higher densities. This is the core of these two. Uh, systems and that is very cold and actually when the collapse appears this suddenly jumps to infinite density or rather we cannot calculate it anymore anymore because it's inside of the uh, black hole uh, merger here you see also two lines one line black line and the second black line here those are calculations for a system which we have studied experimentally at GSI, 
in the four pi detector and in the hardest detector at roughly uh, gamma CM, so a, a, a kinetic factor of 1.5 and 2 in the laboratory with heavy ions. This is gold gold collided with 600 MeV per nucleon, and this is gold gold collided with 1200 um, MeV per nucleon, and you see the temperature goes up, but in principle, the time evolution goes down, and we measured that this is uh, expansion as constant entropy. Also here, it's constant entropy. So our prediction is that you can study neutron star, neutron star encounters and nucleus, nucleus encounters, and at the GSI machine here in, in, in Darmstadt, very close to Frankfurt, you get exactly the same temperatures and densities and entropies per baryon in the laboratory as you can see in the universe. These guys actually you cannot see in the universe because they collapse then so quickly to a black hole and you have only the gravitational wave to see it. But these guys you see also in the optical spectrum and this expansion you can actually also see in the afterglow of a binary neutron star collapse and also an afterglow of supernova collapse as I will show a little bit later. So very interesting in German, we would say Stern, Stern equals Kern, Kern. Star, Star equals Nucleus, Nucleus. Very interesting. Anton then took this uh, idea up and he plotted T versus the chemical, oops, sorry, C versus the chemical potential. And here you see different um, indications for crossing transition. Here is this famous liquid vapor phase transition. And this is the Taub adiabat. This is what happens when you increase initial energy from 1.9 GeV, which is two nuclei which just sit next to each other and don't do anything, up to 2.23 GeV, 4 GeV, 6 and 8 GeV. And you see that you pump energy in the biochemical potential into the repulsive forces. But then when you make more and more quarks, the line bends over and you get to higher, higher, higher entropies per baryon. And those are the isentropic expansion curves of the system, which in the end always ends up in stuff which is close to ground state nuclear matter at 20 MeV. So we hit the liquid vapor phase transition very late, but we hit the quark transformation of nucleons into quarks um, early here you know, on the way up. Very nice result, which is also then translated here, measuring uh, measuring the, the temperature um, here, and the scale is over here, 100 MeV would be here, and the density, which is this, uh, scale is over here. And you see that in this region between 2 GeV and 3 GeV, the density reaches this density, which we discussed before, five to six times nuclear matter density, where there is more and more quarks reached, so at about three GeV, and the temperatures are between, well, let's say here 60, oh, I always push the wrong button, 60 to about 100 MeV. So nucleus, nucleus equals star, star collision, very similar in the density, which is the solid lines and in the temperature. So now, uh, I have to skip this because of time. Just want to show you that here you have the quark fraction as a function of chemical potential and temperature. And you see here the quark fraction is high, close to one, roughly at uh, these very high chemical potentials. You remember the curve went something up like here. And there is almost no quarks here at temperatures below 150 MeV and biochemical potentials uh, at about 1.2 GeV. Only at very high biochemical potentials, very high temperatures, you have a high quark fraction. But as you remember, neutron stars collapse when you reach already this area. So a neutron star which comes here will collapse. The chiral condensate, which says more or less uh, what the dynamics of the baryons is, says 
all baryons and mesons will behave more or less neutral uh, at temperatures below 150 MeV, but then they will uh, completely change their behavior uh, here. But you see, this is two phase transitions, the chiral transition, this is the one here, first order until here, and then it's the second order. And the system is still a, a hadronic liquid, but up here, this is this, transition, it's actually a crossover transition. That is as much higher biochemical potentials and much higher temperatures. So very interesting result. Uh, oh, something is hooked. Yeah, so what is the heavy ion collision physics then doing? Neutron star, neutron star collisions are here. Heavy ion collisions can reach higher temperatures, but this is already very exciting. This is 100 MeV. So you can easily pass 100 MeV when you have ultra relativistic collisions. The neutron star, neutron star collisions will stay below 100 MeV. So what we do is we build a GSI now. This is the GSI, which you see here. We are building a GSI. Uh, the facility for antiproton and ion research. Similar activities are HIAV in China, NICA in Dubna, STAR in Brookhaven, which make all neutron star matter in the laboratory by heavy ion collisions. This shows about a year ago the status of the system. This is the big new accelerator, which uh, is called Schwer Ionen Synchrotron 100, SIS 100. And we have room on top of this. The Americans and the Italians are interested in building an even higher energy facility, SIS 300. Mm -hmm. This is the area here where we have um, a special detector device, the one which is already finished, is presently located here, but will move into this cave, which is called HADES. It's an international collaboration. And then uh, we have a new detector where we have only a preliminary version running until now, which is the mini compressed baryon matter detector, but I show you, of course, the full detector. This is the full detector hardest, which exists already, uh, which you see here, the beam comes from the left, hits the target here, and all over the place here, you can actually see the result of the reaction, or you move this detector to the side and the beam hits the target of the compressed baryon matter detector, which is only in um, a prototype ready now, which is a very complicated uh, detector with a lot of, um, a lot of uh, systems, which you see here, built by uh, India and France and lots of lots of nations which are involved. Um, and uh, here you see now how does this look in a dynamical hydrodynamical situation, which is similar to the things which we saw before, but heavy ions, relativistic heavy ions. The two nuclei hit each other. Very hot, very dense matter is formed in the middle. And here you see the temperature, very hot, very dense. And this is calculations of Jan um, here at FIAS. And then the system uh, explodes and calms down while here you see also total black, but that doesn't mean a black hole is formed, but it just means that the system runs away from this very hot, dense uh, system. That's our hydrodynamic special relativistic code. So here yeah, now you can compare on the left-hand side, neutron stars hitting each other in the Y X plane. So the pole goes out of the plane here at the zero zero component. And you see all these different regions. And here you see the gold gold collision in heavy ions. So you see the colors are similar, these colors. So the material here and the material here has roughly the same state. And uh, down here, you see uh, the temperatures. So very similar um, uh, densities and temperatures are reached, but the, uh, the geometry of the collision is quite different because here on the left-hand side, the neutron stars have all this rotational energy. On the right-hand side, uh, you have more or less 
um, the moderate rotation, at least on this case. So here now you can see the heavy iron constant entropy expansion. You see here beautifully these curves as function of different energies. So at two and a half GeV or something like this, square root of S, you get this very nice isentropic expansion. In the neutron star is a more distributed thing, but here you have also roughly um, 1.8 um, uh, entropy per baryon expansion. This is in the outer area. And then you have on top, I showed you before, this very high density, very low temperature um, place which vanishes into the black hole in the neutron stars. So you see what I showed before, the entropy per baryon is similar. The temperature in the ring in the neutron star is very similar to the uh, heavy ion collision, but then there is this high, high density, rather uh, cold part uh, outside. This shows again the comparison. Here are the neutron stars which come into each other as a function of time. And you see the color code is identical on both sides. You reach not quite as high temperatures as in the heavy ion collision, which proceeds in time in this direction. And here the neutron star proceeds in this direction. So the geometry is quite different. However, um, the, the thermodynamics is almost identical. Here you see it again, entropy per baryon 2.2, entropy per baryon 1.8. So you see beautifully hydrodynamics uh, is established very nicely. Uh, and you see here that this this very low temperature, very high density, which goes into the black hole. And the energies is really energies which we have already now and are using already now at GSI with the CIS-18, the present running uh, uh, experiment um, is based on the machine which we built there roughly 30 years ago. Very nice. This is also the energies which were already 40 years ago uh, established at the Bevalac in Berkeley. So moderate energies, you reach not too high a temperature, so you can exactly match what you see in the neutron star collision. This now shows you an analogous uh, analysis of the supernova core collapse. This is by Pia Jacobus and Anton Motonenko. And you see also here the density temperature in supernova core collapse, also this isentropic expansion. And again, you see you reach similar temperatures, not uh, uh, not uh, um, too high, so similar as in the neutron star uh, mergers, but we have not done or not been successful in uh, checking what the gravitational waves in this system uh, actually do. It could be that we also here find uh, this system. This is another setup and it shows again uh, that the neutron star, the supernova, and our uh, machine in, uh, in Darmstadt, they all reach similar thermodynamics, um, as you can see here. Uh, this is details here. You see what can happen when you have these two separated, sorry, two separated, uh, always if I reach this, <laughs> I'm sorry about this, these two separated regions here, um, the ring, the outer ring, and here the inner core. Now you reach three, four, five times nuclear matter density, and suddenly the system collapses. There is a first order phase transition. Then the system collapses almost instantaneously, and you create a black hole for this very high cold, very high density, but low temperature thing. This would be the picture which you see in the gravitational wave detectors. We showed this before. Here is the collapse into a black hole. However, if you add into the equation of state quarks, then you collapse much earlier. We discussed why this is the case. Here's the merger point. And all the times here are in milliseconds. And if you have another equation of state, the collapse without quarks comes earlier at 10 rather than 20. And with quarks, the collapse becomes even earlier. And that is just for a system uh, which has a high, as an almost identical but slightly higher mass in this. So it's very sensitive to the details of the mass and to the equation of state.
Well, there is a very interesting behavior which we see in the gravitational waves which is a mismatch of the hadronic in spiral, which is here, and the post-merger phase, which is here, which is extremely sensitive to masses, to the equation of state, and so on. And with this, I would like to finish my presentation. I would like to thank you all very much. Uh, I'm deeply honored and uh, I'm very delighted uh, to be recipient of your honorary degree. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Stoker, for very exciting lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, let us uh, thank Professor Stoker. And uh, now we have, uh, we, we can put some questions. Uh, does somebody like to put questions? Sorry, sorry may I ask? Yes, please. Uh, and, uh, and uh, what you, is your opinion um, about the existent, existence of another intermediate state uh, for investigations between quark stars and black holes? Uh, these are so-called prions. Uh, they have huge densities, but uh, they are not uh, yet black holes. Yeah, um, I think this is somewhat similar when you do the second solution of Schwarzschild. The, the question, what is the microscopic structure of the matter at ultra high densities is of course <clears throat> unsettled. So uh, what we do here, we just rely on uh, perturbative quantum cobalt dynamics, which doesn't have this new form of matter, which you mentioned, Leons, and uh, the lattice, uh, uh, quantum chromodynamics. And both of these theories say that there is an actually unknown uh, phase, which is not possible to describe neither by lattice QCD nor by perturbative QCD. And um, this uh, Stefan Boltzmann freedom, which comes at extremely high energy densities, temperatures and baryon densities, that uh, I think is pretty um, clear that this has to come. But what is between the standard, uh, what we, we have discussed here, the standard uh, normal nuclear matter density or three or five times nuclear matter density and infinite energy density, there is of course room for other forms which cannot be excluded based on perturbative QCD and lattice QCD because one can simply not um, apply those two theoretical methods at mm -hmm. densities of five to 10. So mm -hmm. it depends on, on the details of the vacuum structure at very, very high energy densities. So my personal opinion is I would not say no, but I would say the way it, uh, the chiral mean field model, the lattice QCD and the perturbative uh, QCD uh, merge at densities which are considerably above 10 times nuclear matter density, I think the room for exotic additional states between five mm -hmm. and 15 times nuclear matter density, that's uh, I see room, but not at a thousand times nuclear matter density because this is already reasonably well covered by QCD. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, but, thank you. But very I must admit, I don't know exactly what the densities are where the prion would actually be formed. That is, mm -hmm. of course, a matter of what you put into the, the model system, which you describe. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, dear colleagues, more questions? No questions. Okay, so let us thank uh, Professor Stoker once more. And uh, Thank you. Dear Professor Stoker, uh, it's a pity that we cannot uh, give you with a diploma today, but we shall find the possibility 